if you get an increase in the gold price, I'm not saying you will, but if you get an increase in the gold price from $1,700 to three or $4,000 an ounce, which I think could happen, and if it happens over five years, the impact of that on the precious metals equities would be truly stupid. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a first-time guest today and a returning guest. Our first-time guest is George Salamis. He's the president and CEO of Integra Resources. He joins us together with Rick Rule of Rule Investment Media this Friday, June 18th, 2021. Gentlemen, thanks for coming back on for a panel discussion. Pleasure, sir. Pleasure. Dunnigan, great to meet you. And Rick, good to see you again. Rick has a habit of connecting us with people who are of interest to our viewing community, our viewers are highly interested in basically real things. They're interested in things that can reduce risk to their financial futures for their families. And they found that monetary metals, among other natural resources, are of interest to them because they are real. And uh, any company that deals with the production or uh, make derives an income, makes a business off of that is also of interest. And so we uh, want to have you on here to introduce you to our audience. And we're hoping for a, just a very free-flowing discussion. Everyone should feel welcome to interrupt at any time. That'll be, that'll be just fine. And uh, if we could uh, start off, one of the things that Rick has told us over and over again through the years and many appearances on our channel is that when you're looking as he does through the, the haystack of possible investments in natural resource companies, one of the most important characteristics, if perhaps not the most important characteristic is not so much just what they're doing currently, but who they are and what they've done in the past, what the track record is. And Rick, you've talked to us about people who are serially successful and people who are proven producers and management teams that have earned uh, reason for our respect. Could you, in that regard, remind us why uh, you come from that angle? And then George, maybe you can give us some examples on why that might fit you and your team. My experience has been that uh, if bad people <laughs> own good rocks that somehow the advantage that would accrue to investors from the good rocks gets wasted. Uh, if good people own good rocks, there's a good outcome uh, and rocks become better when good people own them. It isn't just that a team is serially successful. I think that's important. And there are in fact people who are successful in several walks of life. What I would like to see is a team that has a track record of success that's immediately applicable to the task at hand. That is, if they're in the discovery phase, I want them to be good explorationists. I want them to be good explorationists uh, in, in the same type of rock package that they're currently involved in. If they're mine developers, uh, I, I wanna see a, a history of success in mine development. If they're build and sell, uh, that's what I wanna see. So I wanna see successful experience, but I wanna see more than that. I wanna see successful experience that's relevant to the task at hand, not just in the CEO. I want the CEO to tell me uh, why board members are selected and what roles that they might fulfill uh, and why the management team is selected. And I want to hear too that the management team is invested. Uh, I want partners, not employees. Fairly big ticket. Uh, but the truth is I want it all. Uh, in order to separate me from my money, uh, you got to give me most of what I want. George, does anything that Rick just said remind you of yourself or your team? And if so, could you tell us how and where? It sounds like the ask from back in the days with Placer, where I started my career, where we want a you know, 5 million ounce deposit, 5 grams per ton, open pitable, easy metallurgy within 100 meters from surface. And uh, you know, call us when you're, you're building the mine, right? It's, it's a Soul. tall order. <laughs> so uh, it, it is a tall order. You know, this is something that I use in my own investment strategy, you know, bet the horse and bet the jockey same time. And, and it seems to work most of the times um, with respect to our, our team here at Integra Resources. It's something that we've done before. We've, we're, it's coming up on almost four years to the day uh, that we transacted the Integra gold asset, uh, the triangle project in Northern Quebec. And that was a great run. Um, from exploration to underground development. And then, you know, pre pulling the trigger on commercial production, we were taken over for $600 million. And, you know, the beauty of that transaction, if you will, um, was the, the gang stayed together. It's the same team. And, you know, we could have gone off in different directions, gone, you know, snowmobiling, uh, snowboarding, 
surfing, whatever, uh, but we chose not to do that. Instantly after that deal, we jumped into this new project in southwestern Idaho called Delamar, and we aim to do it again. It's the same playbook. And you know, even before that, going back to you know, the early 2000s, my first M&A transaction with a, a uh, uh, an unknown uh, at the time, or not well-known at the time, um, gold asset called the Suri Kuzuko dep uh, deposit in northern Finland, which became the target of my first M&A transaction with Agnico Eagle. That's gone on to be, you know, successful mining asset for them, certainly. Um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and um, learned a lot along the way. Rick, you've also mentioned, in addition to the team that you're looking for, uh, you also look for, the because you, there's a scarcity about the nature of the assets, where they're located, uh, what, you know, and the related infrastructure and the financing around that, what's the combination of, of sort of sweet factors that you think are proven successful in your view? Well, the most important to me is scale. Uh, we've talked about this before, Dunnigan, too many times, guys have to go to look for small mines and occasionally, unfortunately, they succeed. Uh, a small mine at best can make you small money. Uh, and the idea that you would take big risk for small money seems silly. So I like to see something with at least a, in the gold business, at least a million ounces recoverable that could produce uh, at rates above 100,000 ounces a year. In other words, I want the scale in place. And I want to see something buildable too. Uh, I have been involved in several discoveries in places that were so remote that although the deposits are attractive on paper, the upfront capital costs associated with building them are so extraordinary that they're <laughs> not economic. Yeah, they're unlikely to get built. So uh, I'm I, I'm sensitive to that. I'm also, in terms of deposit type, uh, sensitive to grade. If somebody's talking to me about an oxide gold heap leach deposit, I want it to be in the best quartile worldwide in terms of return on capital employed. Uh, and also in terms of all in sustaining costs. So if you're going to give me average grade, you better give me great metallurgy or something else. Uh, in other words, uh, I'm really bored when somebody comes to me with a gold mine and gives me the gold narrative you know, about why I should buy gold. I already know why I should buy gold. I want to know why I should buy their gold uh, and why, as a consequence of their team, their deposit is going to be uh, best of breed in terms of return on capital employed and best of breed in the global cost curve. That's what I want to see. And uh, what about in, in also in terms of location, is there proximity to, you know, certain types of infrastructure or certain types of other supportive infrastructure that you look for and the financial aspects as well? Obviously it's lovely uh, if the issuer, the people that you're invested in, don't have to build a bunch of infrastructure. If a bunch of infrastructure exists, as an example, in the case of Georgia's deposit, uh, <laughs> it's a former mine, uh, which means <laughs> there's zero death that you can build a mine there because the mine was built there. Uh, and George can probably tell you about how that impacts things like the permitting risk. But there's a whole interplay of factors. If you give me a whole bunch of grade uh, and a whole bunch of size, then you can commit some sins elsewhere. Uh, think of a mine as a stew. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can make us do. Uh, there's a whole bunch of good ways. There's a whole bunch of bad ways, but you know, I, I like, uh, I like a little of everything. I'm probably less fussy about jurisdiction, frankly. Uh, it's nice to be in a place where the rule of law, you know, uh, applies. It's nice to be in a place that has good infrastructure. If you give me a superb deposit, I've, I've made, personally wonderful money in places like Congo or Kazakhstan, but it was tougher. Uh, and your cost of capital is higher. The idea that you can have a, a whole bunch of good things in a place that speaks your language and where at least uh, in the case of the United States, nominally the rule of law applies. That's wonderful. George, any of those uh, elements that Rick outlined as his top priorities as an analyst that strike a chord with you as at the helm of, of Integra Resources? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I was, as Rick was talking, I was kind of reflecting on 30 years in the business and going back through the, the, uh, the roller coaster ride of, of building assets in various jurisdictions. And, you know, what I've found is um, if I'm in a tier three jurisdiction, i.e. an unsafe jurisdiction with, with a, without a strong rule of law, 
I'm typically spending about 50% of the time, you know, on a presentation trying to convince somebody why they need to look at this jurisdiction and why they don't need to be, you know, afraid of investing in this jurisdiction. And that takes up a lot of time and bandwidth. And so this is why kind of in the latter stages of my career, I've stuck to the easy, easier places, uh, Canada and the U.S. Um, so that sort of park that for a second. One of the points that Rick touched on, which I've found really germane throughout my career, is having having the ability as a management group to say we can we can build this. We have the wherewithal to build it. We, in other words, we don't have to sit there and wait to wave the take me over flag forever. Um, and with that, it goes the financeability. If if it it's if it's an order of magnitude of capital that our group. Um, can say hand over heart we can raise, i.e. not billions of dollars to build, that makes the story all, all that much stronger, uh, ultimately. So it's, it's those two things. And then probably the third thing, which maybe Rick didn't touch on, but has been really important to me in my career, is, is the optionality factor of um, different uh, development scenarios. In other words, you know, can a small mine be built and ramped up? Can a very large mine be built and from straight out of the gate, could you start underground and go to open pit mining or vice versa? Having those options available to you as a developer and operator, I've seen that in my career in spades um, is super important. And Delamar has all of those hallmarks in Southwestern Idaho. Rick, did you have any specific uh, questions for George that we should ask about, about the, um, specific projects that are at the front of, of mind right now for them, some of their more premier ones. You mentioned already, he said he's, he's got an asset that you don't have to wonder whether you can develop a mine there because it's already been a mine in the past and they're trying to bring it back to life. Well, we should start, I think, in fairness to your readers by saying I'm already a fairly large existing shareholder of Integra. Uh, and so this is hardly uh, a de novo discussion. Uh, your listeners should understand that there are large existing conflicts of interest. And this discussion uh, isn't a pro forma discussion. It's a sort of a follow-on discussion. I would say for me, what I'm interested in now with Integra, and it would be useful, George, if you could give a sort of an overview of the deposit just in terms of size. But what particularly interests me is that the deeper drilling that you've done over the last year and a half has identified a much higher grade component to the deposit, which gives you an awful lot of flexibility. Maybe the ability to put high grade through a mill uh, while you're working uh, on the oxide halos. Uh, I, I mean, it, it seems to give you more flexibility. So if you could give people an overview uh, of something about the size of the deposit uh, and its scale, that is, it, it seems to be an asset worth messing with. Uh, but then also tell us, uh, in the words of that great investor, Janet Jackson, uh, what you've done for us lately uh, in terms of, uh, it, it, you know, developing this uh, higher grade target that you're talking about. I think that would be useful. Got it. Got it. Sure can. So it may be kind of starting at the, the high level, Rick. Um, so it's 4.4 million ounces of gold equivalent in southwestern Idaho, as, as we've talked about already. It's a mine that was in production up until the early 2000s. So essentially, this is a mine restart in the end of the day, more than a new mine build. But we're heading down a different track from a production perspective, and we'll get to that in a sec. Um, we've, been, we've been really pursuing a lot of bulk tonnage, low-grade gold and silver mineralization. I should probably take this opportunity to talk about the silver component too, because it's important. And I think it's something that goes largely unrecognized in the context of Delamar. Um, you know, in and amongst the 4.4 million ounces of gold equivalent, there's 120 million ounces of silver. And you know, as we demonstrated, as Rick kind of alluded to, we've been putting out some high grade silver results of late up to like 6,600 grams per ton silver and drill intercepts. So 6.6 .6 kilos per ton, that's, that's a, a lot of silver. And um, just historically, this, this district has gone back and forth between uh, a primary silver producer with a gold credit or a primary gold producer with a silver credit, just depending on the price of silver relative to gold. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at now from a development perspective is, you know, how can we, how can we maximize returns for shareholders? And I think we'll, we'll demonstrate that in the upcoming studies. Um, really aimed at this time around more, more silver recovery. And that's something that we're working on, which I think our investors will see in the upcoming um, PFS study, which is due out at the end of the year. 
And uh, you know, originally we were looking at our 125,000 ounces of gold equivalent production per annum um, for you know, $160 million. So something we could cred credibly finance today if we were to choose to go down that path. And then um, this, next, this next PFS that we're gonna put out is gonna be more optimized towards silver recovery. The PEA had a, a rough sort of revenue split of gold uh, to silver of 80-20. So 20% of the revenue was derived from silver. Um, this time around, we think it's going to be well north of that based on some of the tweaks we're making to the PFS. Now, to kind of shift focus, because we've been talking about bulk tonnage resources and, and bulk tonnage open pit mining, as Rick alluded to, over the past uh, two and a half years, we've been releasing these high-grade results uh, to, the, to the investing public, which are largely speaking outside of any of the resource boundaries that we put together. And so we've been thinking about sort of the what if, the what, the what if of what would it take to bring those high grade resources that are currently outside of a resource model into a resource category? And then what would those look like in a mine plan? And then what could those look like in terms of, you know, additions to bulk tonnage open pit mining? And we've done our calculations. The returns are spectacular. I mean, really spectacular um, from a myriad of perspectives, from a production profile uh, revenues, you know, all of that good stuff that shareholders want to see. So it's something that we're seriously looking at right now. Um, high grade underground a definition, if you will, of, of high grade resources, gold and silver underneath Florida mountain in particular. You know, you're, what you were saying, George, about the shift in value that can be delivered through either emphasizing gold or silver, depending on the marketability and the price uh, ratio between those is something that's been of high interest to our viewers. They are on the retail investing side for precious metals and for companies that produce them. And they often ask, I think, a, a very honestly empathetic question towards mining companies of how you have been impacted by unnaturally, perhaps uh, lower prices of metals over the past decade. Uh, it's been pointed out on several occasions on our channel that silver and a very few other things are the only commodities, for example, industrial of industrial demand that are still at a fraction of their 1980 previous high. And how has that affected uh, companies like yours? And what would change in your world if that ratio were to significantly swing to where silver becomes, you know, order um, factors higher than, than today in terms of nominal price? Yeah, in a sense, done again, it's, all, it's already changed for us. I mean, the, the last uh, basis of calculation for our PA study was, I believe, we used 1350 gold and 1690 silver. Well, the silver price has gone up 50% since then. So we can already see the benefits of, of a higher silver price in the equation, which is why we're doing more optimization work to recover more silver in, in this upcoming study, which we will do. I've got no, no doubt about that. Um, and I just think, you know, silver is one is see commodities that's going to get better on a myriad of fronts. There's, you know, there's there's industrial demand, as you pointed to. There is um, there's there's an there's a sustainability component to it. There's a green energy component, if you will, that drives the silver de demand criteria. So, you know, all of those things are just going to make silver better, in my view. We have, and maybe Rick, if you want to weigh in on this at all, there's been questions, and this one's asked from our viewer, what is your outlook on the price of gold if affected by the Basel III net stable funds ratio effect that takes effect on June 28th? People are wondering about, is this, can we anticipate that there will be something in the metals uh, economic uh, picture that's going to make a dramatic change in metals prices in, the, in this year? Are you expecting that, Rick? No, uh, I, I don't think that uh, one needs to look to Basel III. What one needs to look at is the depreciation of the currency at currently 4.5% compounded, which I think goes up in the face of negative real interest rates. Uh, I think that Basel, frankly, is an excuse for gold bugs to get excited. Uh, and I don't think it's excited. Um, I don't think it's needed. I'm already excited. <laughs> gold price does well when you um, undermine faith in savings instruments denominated in fiat currencies. Uh, and although the government isn't doing very many good things, it's doing a spectacular job of undermining faith in conventional savings instruments. It may be that Basel III changes the way that big banks uh, account for some of their derivative positions in precious metals. Uh, but I think that's a sideshow. Uh, 
gold, well, precious metals and precious metals related assets right now are one half of 1% of total investments and savings assets in the United States. You don't need a reset. Uh, what you need is a reversion to mean. Over three decades, precious metals have been one and a half to 2% uh, market share of savings and investment assets in the United States. Uh, the idea that you tweak with central banking arrangements uh, and that that's important relative simply to the fact that the government is doing a wonderful job of undermining faith uh, in savings instruments uh, means that I think the gold price takes care of itself. I think what happens to many speculators is that if they want something to happen, which is to say they're long, they want it to happen in three weeks. Uh, and they think that what they want matters. Uh, it's merely what you can have. If you get an increase in the gold price, I'm not saying you will, but if you get an increase in the gold price from $1,700 to three or $4,000 an ounce, which I think could happen. And if it happens over five years, the impact of that on the precious metals equities uh, would be truly stupid. If you had a less dramatic impact, it would still generate really, truly superb returns on capital employed, particularly relative to other less attractive asset classes like U.S. 10-year treasuries. So uh, I think your, your questioner asks an interesting question, but I don't think that the question that he or she asks is the most valid question with regards to the conclusion that he or she would like to draw. It's interesting because along the way, I couldn't help but think as you were talking about the loss in confidence that's being engendered through mismanagement of our fiat currency. We've had in, in this in this last year, we've had uh, basically that gets turned around and blamed on the ordinary person, uh, whether it's that mismanagement, loss in, loss in the confidence in the currency, whether it's loss in confidence in, in valid elections, whether it's con loss in confidence in medical or emergency medical management of things. Um, and then it's blamed on, oh, you, it's, it's you people who aren't towing the line well enough that are, that are um, that are causing this loss of confidence. And it's like, no, maybe there's actually <laughs> a loss of um, trustworthiness on the part of, of some of these centralized power places. Um, George, I had a follow-up question from a different viewer who asked, what is Integra doing to protect, protect the environment in the jurisdictions where they're operating? Uh, I mean, short answer, lots, and we're just kind of gaining steam with that because, you know, post PFS, we're heading into the the key um, permitting phase, right? Which is which is a prescriptive step, series of steps to get to the, what's called a record of decision in the U.S., which allows us or somebody else to build a mine out there. So we've started stakeholder engagement already, um, which is a key key aspect with the First Nations in in Idaho. Uh, with the key stakeholders around the project, that's great. Um, we 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 are about to kick off a number of really interesting initiatives with uh, several groups looking at environmental sustainability, to use an over overused word, um, which I think will be quite interesting. We've talked about as well um, the engagement of a firm called Warm Springs out of Idaho uh, to do what I would characterize as a shadow pre-feasibility study. So essentially, it's a group that works alongside of our core engineering group and feeds in ideas of, hey, maybe, maybe you could look at uh, more sustainable initiatives from a development perspective in, in your overall build plan. And if they make economic sense and they're more sustainable, why not use them in the study? So this, is, this group just feeds that sort of th uh, those ideas into into our PFS crew, and and uh, I think we'll see something that will be groundbreaking in terms of a PFS that is probably more uh, sustainable, more friendly uh, from a myriad of perspectives relative to other studies that have been put out there. So we're doing a lot is the short answer on the ground. Rick, I noticed you cracked a big grin when I asked the question. I know you've had some thoughts about this in the past. Is there, from your standpoint as an analyst looking across many companies, what do you consider to be the most valid, the most legitimate concerns that you think uh, companies that you are willing to invest in should be paying attention to that have to do with environment and local uh, relationships with local communities, that sort of thing? I think the site uh, and the nature of the mineralization. Uh, remember that George isn't trying to build something in the middle of Yellowstone or Yosemite. Uh, he's looking to build a mine uh, on a mine site. <laughs> so 
So uh, in terms of disturbing local watersheds by moving roads around, the roads have been there for 30 years. The impact of the road and the watershed has already been studied and mitigated. The deposit isn't, as an example, a volcanogenic massive sulfide. It isn't something that's going to leach uh, acid into the soil or the groundwater. The metallurgy is already well known. Uh, it isn't a deposit that's going to shed ar uh, a lot of arsenic, as an example. So uh, the things that I look for as an analyst that are deal stoppers uh, were dealt with in the original permit. Uh, after that, it simply becomes being a decent human being and employing common sense. The idea that you, in a rural community, particularly uh, an indigenous community, uh, that you wouldn't get along with your hosts. God knows in the mining business, we didn't when I came into the business. Uh, that's just plain stupid. Uh, and we were just plain stupid. But one of the things you see is that people who have been successful in mining for the last 25 years have learned those lessons. The truth is that the local uh, community uh, has more to gain from your operation than the community at large. And dealing with the local community means that you have an ally on side in any ensuing political fight that becomes important. In other words, the people who used to be your adversaries are now your allies if you cultivate them carefully. But I'm preaching to the choir. George had to do that at Placer. He had to do it with the Cree in Northern Quebec. I mean, the guy's been there and done that. Um, you will, of course, have uh, environmental uh, objection from the Upper East Side in New York and from K Street in Washington and from Hollywood, you know, that all happens, but you have to do the right thing and you have to mitigate that by building coalitions with local people uh, who will ultimately protect you against K Street and Hollywood. You know, something you just said, and George, I wanted to get away in on that because Rick, you've talked to us in the past about how people need to remember because uh, George, you said, uh, quote unquote, uh, environmental sustainability for mining. Rick, you've talked to us about how mining is, you're talking about a depleting as asset. You're not talking about something that's going to go on forever, but it just made a light bulb go off for me because you both have been talking about the the scale, the importance of deposits that have scale, because that could translate into not only just the financial aspect, but also when you talk about employment opportunities or ownership participation or whatever on the part of local communities, that kind of thing, how it's going to play out and affect them. So George, could you, could you touch on that regarding to how important scale is to you in your projects and how important that ends up being for the local communities in terms of sustainability within a, a you know, human scale time frame? Yeah, uh, well, again, there, there's, there's an element as Rick used the, the expression preaching to, to the choir you know, there's an element of that where we are in, in southwestern Idaho, the, the closest community of Jordan Valley. They're all former Kinross employees who worked at the mine not too long ago, and most of them are employed by us. So there's not a lot of convincing to do there, we we feel, but we're not relying on that. Obviously, that's just a, a piece. Really, um, there's a larger piece, which is Hawaii County, which is, I, I believe, it's top five largest counties in, in the in the uh in continental U.S. in the southern 48, um, has a population base of something like eight or ten thousand people, and you know to to envisage creating a, a mine that's going to employ 500 people, and you know the rule of thumb that we use in the mining business for every mine site job there are three others that are created. So 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 figure that sort of so start thinking about 1,500 jobs, high paying jobs too. I mean we we can time and time again that the mining business or the resource extraction business pays the highest salaries, no question about that. Think about that that economic input into a, a place like Hawaii County that's so sparsely populated. It's gonna be huge for the county, it'd be huge for the state, um, huge amount of benefits. Obviously we have to do it right, construct it right, and, and gain the social license to get there. And uh, these are all things that we're doing right now. So one more question that's related to something that Rick, you just touched on a minute ago, was you said uh, you want to make sure that the companies that you're looking at are, aren't going to have big red flag permitting risks. And you said, well, it's easy, easier to get something permitted that's already been permitted in the past. But that's a specific viewer's question is, how much concern should we have about permitting risks for Integra resources? I can answer that, Rick. That you one's might. yours, George. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Oh, pretend, yeah, so I, pretend I asked the question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it, got it. 
Um, yeah, so we've already already talked about, you know, essentially reopening a, an, an old mining operation that's not that old. It's, you know, less, it's 20 years old. So there was mining there uh, done in the very uh, recent past. Our resources, in terms of the resource layout, gold and silver, the four and a half million ounces approximately between these two deposits, reside on what's called patented ground. Um, and for those who, who are familiar with the land holding um, status or benefits in the U.S., when you own patented rights to, to the subsurface minerals there, it's kind of the holy grail of ownership in terms of your ability to extract uh, those resources out of the ground. You own the, the surface rights and you own the subsurface rights and your rights of extraction go back, you know, 100 years and been grandfathered up to that point. point. So that's what we have. Not to say we won't be dealing with the, the state um, permitting bodies and the, and the federal ones, the BLM, we will be, but that makes our job easier. Those, those extractions that we're gonna be doing reside on pad to ground, that makes our life easier. Um, second, second piece that we have is we've engaged with the BLM really early. Uh, in fact, the BLM, we started talking to them this time last year about mine building. And that's not typically what, what a company like ours does in advance of a PFS, pre-feasibility study. Um, we typically do that after the pre-feasibility study is, is delivered, but the, the BLM concluded that, look, there, because this is a, a previously affected area, lots known, it's a past mining operation, you guys at Integra should probably get started in advance to get your ducks in a row for permitting. So that, that helps. So we're seeing, we're seeing signs from the BLM that they're, they're being extremely cooperative on that, on that end. Um, you know, and just the climatic condition where we are. I mean, we're, it's high, dry, semi-arid desert, 5,000 to 7,500 feet of altitude. Uh, not a lot of precipitation. Um, you know, the creeks mostly, for the most part, run dry in that area. So there's really not a lot to affect out there. So it's it's not one thing. It's a myriad of things that we believe when you put together in aggregate will make our permitting relatively prescriptive and straightforward. Well, we want to make sure that we give people a chance to find out more who are interested. If people want to find out more about Integra specifically, where should they go and how can they get plugged in? So, uh, IntegraResources.com is our website. Um, our, uh, our corp dev, our IR team would be happy to answer questions. One of the things that we do do a lot of is, is direct feedback. We don't pretend you know, to sit on our thrones and not answer questions. We do uh, very actively, and I think we do a very good job at it. So start there, that's a great starting point. We do actually have a function on our website that allows you to schedule a meeting with the company. And uh, so try that out. That's, a, I, that's, a that's how I got That's how I got my first meeting with your, uh, your investor resources department was I went ahead and scheduled myself into a meeting. I thought, I like this, this is great. Yeah, so it worked out well. Are. Yeah, sure has. Rick, uh, we also wanted to give you a chance to, if you wanted to, re-up your offer to grade our in our subscribers' resource investment portfolios. Of course. Um, I am happy to personally rank your listeners and subscribers' natural resource investment portfolios. If you go to websites, brotusa.com forward slash rankings and enter your natural resource holdings, please no cryptos, please no technology stocks, please no pot stocks confine an old man to what he's good at. Uh, I'll rank those portfolios one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst, including Integra. And I'll comment on individual in, uh, issues where I think my comments might have value. In addition, uh, if your subscribers would like, if they mention the word charts, I will include in the return email, uh, the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the longest running and most inclusive gold equities index on the planet. And a hundred year commodity chart talking about uh, how cheap industrial commodities are relative to other asset classes versus other investment classes going back 100 years. Once again, SprottUSA.com forward slash rankings. And another reason that we're having this conversation right now for the first time is because we are on the, on the eve next month of the, it used to be the Sprott, now it's the Rural Investment Media 2021 Natural Resources Symposium. Uh, Rick, can you make sure people are understanding how they can get uh, plugged in with that? Yeah, please. There will be a link, uh, I, I suspect, on this website uh, to learn more about the conference. Uh, obviously, now it's my conference. I've been involved in it for 20 years. Simply put, we believe it's the finest uh, high net worth retail investment conference in the planet with regards to natural resources. It's gone on for 20 years. 
we have lots of great big thinker, big picture thinkers talking to you uh, about uh, economic macro, gold macro, resource macro. But more important than that, we have a curated list of exhibitors. At most investment conferences, the qualification to be an exhibitor uh, is a pulse and a check that caches, usually in reverse order of importance. Uh, at our conference, the attendees have told us that the exhibitors are content too. In other words, they come for investment opportunities. And so we vet them. Specifically, if we don't own them, they don't exhibit. Simple as that. Doesn't mean that every exhibitor that we have has a, has a share price that explodes over the ensuing 12 months. It just means that we have vetted exhibitors and we consider them to be content too. I'm confident enough in the quality of the con uh, uh, conference now, having done it for 20 years, that any of your listeners or subscribers uh, who pays the admission fee, note that it's a virtual conference this year, not a physical conference, but anybody who doesn't believe that they got their money's worth will bear no financial risk because I'll give them a full refund upon request. Please don't take advantage of me in this circumstance, but if you don't believe for any reason that you haven't received sufficient return on capital employed, uh, I will happily make sure that your capital employed balance gets reduced to zero. And folks, if you want to, at the same time, support our channel and support our work and help us to keep bringing content to you here on Liberty and Finance by using the link that's specifically underneath this video, you'll get uh, registered for the, for the conference in a way that also helps support our channel. So it's a twofer and we all uh, benefit from that. So I appreciate your support there as well. I just wanted to thank you both, uh, George Salamis, President and CEO of Integra Resources and Rick Rule for joining us together for the first time here on Liberty and Finance. Thank you. Pleasure.